Hello everyone and welcome back to What Above a Pollen Podcast. I'm Ops and today I'll be joined by Lucky Beans and Veg as we continue our pollen rewatch of season two. But before we get started, our intro today is going to be a little bit different. So in lieu of our traditional introduction, I'm here to have a quick chat with my lovely Lecky. How are you doing, Lecky? I'm okay. It's been kind of a long week as evidenced by the uh, dancing breadcrumbs that you just mm-hmm. posted on our Instagram stories. It's 2am. It's been a long week. Yeah, it's 2 a.m. for you. We've all kind of had a tough week here, sadly. I was almost died at sea today. <laughs> and I believe you were mauled by... Can you be mauled by jellyfish? Whatever can be done to you by a jellyfish <laughs> was done to me. Be it mauling, attacking, near-death experience. On the most remote Greek island, you can imagine that apparently has no medical treatment, no pharmacies. Lovely. <laughs> And the reason we scrapped our original intro for this episode is that Beans sadly lost a furry family member, her cat Bogey, this week. We feel terrible for her. Obviously, pets can bring so much light into our lives. And so in honor of her and Bogey, we'll be making a donation in Bogey's name to Max Fund, which is a no-kill animal shelter in Denver. And no pressure, but if you do feel moved to do so, we'll be sharing a link to Max Fund in our stories on Instagram. Or maybe even consider a donation to a local shelter of your own choice. Time's been difficult for so many recently, and I know that sometimes our furry friends are the things that help us get through it the most. So we're sending so much love to Beans, and so much love to all of you out there too. But Lucky, whilst I've got you here at 2am, can you take us through the breaking crumbs of the week? I'd love to, but it's been a somewhat quiet week in Bridgerton news, which, after the chaos and confusion of the last few weeks, is something of a relief, however. But we do have some cast and crew news, which we're excited to bring you. So, first up, Luke Newton has been in Portugal recording his role as the voice of Thomas in Viana, The Legend of the Golden Hearts, which is an upcoming animated film currently slated for a Christmas 2024 release. So if you were sad about missing Luke on December 14th. (laughs) And it's a musical, which I'm sure many Pollen fans will be delighted to hear. Yes! For those of you who are particularly enamored with Luke singing, who isn't? The vocal coach for the movie actually released a couple of clips of Luke in the recording studio, which was so lovely to see. And for our other lead, Nicola has designed a t-shirt for Choose Love to raise funds for refugees and displaced peoples. The t-shirt is only available to order internationally until the 29th of October. Mm -hmm. A quick update on Nicola's upcoming projects. First, (laughs) looks at both Seize Them and Big Mood have been released. Seize Them was slated for an October 20th release, but it looks like that release date has been pushed back again. So we will keep you updated. We're all kind of used to (laughs) releases being pushed (laughs) back. I'm sure we can all go. I never want to hear the phrase release date ever again. <laughs> Meanwhile, Variety published a feature on Big Mood alongside a few new stills, describing the show as a divinely sardonic and captivating laugh riot. Shonda Rhimes and Betsy Beers are producing a new Barbie documentary for Netflix titled Black Barbie that will tell the story of the first black Barbie doll and the impact three black women at Mattel had on the industry. Shonda was also honored this week at the Human Rights Campaign's 2023 National Dinner. She was presented with the National Equality Award. Jonathan Bailey and Golda Rochevelle were also in attendance at the dinner, where Johnny Bailey presented actor Matt Bomer with an Impact Award. Luke Thompson attended a launch event for a brand new campaign in the UK called Theatre for Every Mm -hmm. Child. The campaign, spearheaded by the Society of London Theatre and UK Theatre, is asking political parties to commit to funding a theatre visit for each child before they leave school. Chris Bowers' documentary, The Last Repair Shop, has been acquired by Searchlight Pictures. The documentary, which has recently received two Critics' Choice Association nominations, will be streamed for free globally from November 8th via the LA Times' website and YouTube channel. And I watched a trailer for this, by the way, and it actually looks really moving, so I would recommend it. Definitely. Season 3 director Andrew Ahn recently appeared on the Cut Fruit podcast, where he discussed his creative process and how his work has helped him recognize the importance of community and identity. And in a little actual Bridgerton news, a few of you may be keeping yourselves busy with the recently released Bridgerton jigsaw puzzle. If so, you might be pleased to know that a deck of Bridgerton playing cards Mm. featuring the same character artwork as the puzzle are due to be released in June 2024. (laughs) I'll add it to the calendar. (laughs) And in strike news, sadly, no further talks have taken place between SAG and the AMPTP Mm. since the studio executives walked out of negotiations last week. In a joint statement, the WGA, the DGA, IATSE, the AFM, Teamsters, and Hollywood Basic Crafts all called for the AMPTP to resume negotiations immediately. The union said, each day a fair contract addressing actresses' unique priorities is delayed is another day working professionals across our industry suffer unnecessarily. At this point, it should be clear to the studios and the AMPTP that more is needed than proposals 
rules which merely replicate the terms negotiated with other unions. Earlier this week, several high-profile actors also made a proposal to SAG in which they offered to remove a cap on their dues in hopes of helping SAG and the AMPTP come closer to an agreement. SAG, after a President Fran Drescher, spoke about the proposal and explained that while generous, they can't really consider it due to federal law and the way that the pension and health plans are funded for SAG. The way they're structured means they have to be funded exclusively from employer contributions. However, Drescher praised the earnest desire to help solve the strike and, as the union approaches the 100th day of striking, urged studios to return to the table saying, AMPTP it's time to negotiate genuinely, valuing our contributions and solidifying an industry that champions everyone within it. And touching on the request for a bigger portion of streaming residuals, she said, we subsidize the growth of the streaming model with reduced rates and low to non-existent residuals. It's time to share the success we helped build. And <laughs> what is this? I haven't even read this yet. In lighter news, this upcoming week, we will all be celebrating the one year anniversary of Nicola sharing the tiniest emoji. <gasps> is it really? Lucky, lucky you're breaking the bit. You're supposed to be telling me the news. <laughs> I didn't read this last one. Okay, sorry. <laughs> Lucky is learning as we go. So next week is the anniversary of Nicola posting the tiniest carriage emoji on her Instagram stories, which we all took to be confirmation of them filming the carriage scene. Yeah, do you remember it? It was the black screen. If you were in the fandom back tiniest then, emoji. you will all vividly remember how much we spiraled over that Yay. teeny tiny emoji. <laughs> and I'm remembering now. And a year later... <laughs> We're still spiraling, so thank you, Nick, as ever, for the crumbs you gave us. Do you remember it now? Yeah, vividly you remember. Yes, yeah. I just didn't realize that it was so soon. Everything is soon, remember. I guess I forgot <laughs> it was October. Time flies when you're a pollen fan. That's one thing that time does, I can tell you that for nothing. Anyway. Lecky, lovely Lecky, I'm missing the others. Should we go find them? Yes. <laughs> Let's head on into the episode. Thank you, Fat Lucky. Last week, we were busy feeding the ducks with Penn and Colin, but this week, we're heading off to the wedding of the year with Anthony and Edwina's doomed nuptials as we break down everything Penn and Colin from season two, episode six, The Choice. Just like last week, this is full to the brim with main plot drama, but for the pollen fans amongst us, we don't care about any of that. I have to say, it's one of my favourites. This is my heart eyes. Ooh. I am so buzzing for this episode. We all living it? I have a slightly different take. Oh, of course you bloody do. I put in my script note for OVS, I put, I want to rant here. Let me have a little bit of time to rant. We'll get to that and it's going to be an interesting conversation we're going to have. That's all I'm going to say. <laughs> <laughs> Whilst we're on the topic, Lady Veg, can you give us our episode summary? Dearest gentle listener, this episode, the wedding that wasn't. In the lead up to Anthony and Edwina's grand wedding, doubts and stresses fly. On wedding eve, the Sharma girls share a beautiful Indian tradition and the Bridgerton boys share a stiff drink. Come wedding day, Colin continues to drown his lack of purpose in a flask and the day spirals out of control as Edwina senses the true feelings between Anthony and Kate. Cousin Jack Arrington and Portia scheme to build a fraudulent jewel investment business. Edwina impresses Queen Charlotte, who helps guide her to decide to call off the wedding. Eloise visits Theo and establishes that their feelings go beyond friendship, and Cantony seal it with a kiss. Wait a second, you conveniently left out the best scene in this episode. Well, no, so I don't touch on this pollen stuff so much. This is just a general what else happens, you know. Note from the editor here, for no apparent reason, just kind of felt like it. I thought it'd be fun to take a little walk down memory lane. So here's a clip from one of our past Lady Veg summaries. Enjoy. Eloise decides to try to uncover Lady Whistledown's identity. What a bar. The ton attends the sensuous trobarb ball. Oh, sorry. Pen didn't even get mentioned. Pen is like dirt on the ground. We'll get to the purpose. You know, we'll get to the key scenes. Mm, we'll see, won't we? Thanks for that, Lady Veg. We appreciate it. <laughs> Shall we get started then? Should we kick things off? Yeah. Just a quick aside as we dive in. During the opening sequence, we see Queen Charlotte preparing for the wedding. And I just love how she knocks over the little crown topper off of one of the pies that's <laughs> been presented for her approval. But then seconds later, she's totally fine with an identical crown topper atop a roasted pig. What exactly is she saying there? <laughs> anyway. I'd never noticed this before, but this little pig is actually surrounded by feathers that make it look like it has wings. Just as Lady Whistledown, speaking of marriage and brides, says that It is a wonder then that 
feet do not tire or, heaven forbid, trip under the scrutiny of all those attentive eyes. And this just made me wonder, was this meant to be like a when pigs fly type of reference hinting that the wedding was never going to take place? I'm probably reaching there, but it's an interesting little prop nonetheless. And hat tip to the delightfully bizarre octopus display and some of the others the crew cooked up for the wedding feast. I love them. But yeah, we find out that the queen has got a grand plan to entrap Lady Whistledown. As the queen says... Every young lady that remains under suspicion of being Lady Whistledown will have a footman assigned to her, watching her every move. What is that? <laughs> Golda, I am so sorry. Oh, that is uh, a oh. liberal interpretation. A liberal interpretation will go with. <laughs> yes, so... Um... Thank you. Here, Queen Charlotte sets in motion a plan to entrap Lady Whistledown by not only assigning footmen to follow their main suspects, but also planting false rumors, thinking they can trick her into publishing one of them. Dun, dun, dun. Beans, this takes place at Hampton Court Palace, right? Correct. Are we due to return that in season three, perhaps? Do, 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 we cross. sure are. So back when they were filming a thousand years ago, <laughs> I mean, January of 2023, <laughs> they were filming at Hampton Court Palace and we actually got like a lot of cool behind the scenes stuff from then which we'll, mm-hmm. obviously you know we'll post on social media but yeah it looked like they were filming inside of the palace itself like in a little courtyard area and then in front of the building too so mm-hmm. we will definitely see them returning and it was in the last block so i'm very interested to see how that's going to drama. tie in yeah how that's going to tie into pollen so Ooh, drama i'm gonna get dragged to the palace and have a head chopped off so uh, exactly funny. she's gonna be in front of the queen i was gonna say did we see a, a big guillotine yeah, yeah. <laughs> colin leaves with pen's head in a basket yeah. like just yeah. crying yeah. on the little biscuit cushion yeah oh god <laughs> <laughs> but penelope we haven't got time to worry about that you need to be worried right here right now because the queen is on to you babe watch your back and listen to those rumors with caution we'll check back in late with you to see how you get on so while the sharmas conduct a beautiful holiday ceremony complete with some lovely insights about love from kate that we sadly don't have time for but it's one of my favorite scenes Gorgeous. The Bridgerton brothers are throwing a Regency bachelor party for a morose Antony. And Colin is starting the episode how he means to go on by getting absolutely pissed. Mm. For the non-British amongst you, that means shit face drunk. And Ben and Colin are helping him celebrate with lots of drinking, lots of bantering, and even a game or two of pool. Benedict and Colin are in high spirits thanks to the said spirits. Antony's suffering through his main plot drama as well as his eternal burden of his duty. So he's not quite as cheerful as the other two. He spent most of the scene giggling, much to my absolute delight. A classically cautious Colin reminds Anthony that it's meant to be a sipping spirit. As we'll see, Colin is something of a lightweight when it comes to drinking, and he and Ben trade some terribly vulgar quips about Anthony, much to the joy of a very unimpressed Viscount. Yes, and we're definitely getting a glimpse of a rather cheeky Colin here. Definitely. He is so sweet in this scene, I love it. Anthony remarks that the younger two have the privilege of not being the firstborn, and Anthony continues on that they both get to choose their passions and adventures. Ben probably being the passion, Colin being a bit of the adventure. Our boy is still trying to find his passion, but it can be a difficult endeavour when you accidentally go to the Mediterranean instead of simply crossing the road. (laughs) But what can you do? I have to say, Colin is a little silkworm in this scene, and (laughs) I'm absolutely not mad at it. (laughs) Best description ever. <laughs> For the listener who hasn't watched the episode, Colin is dressed in a fairly flowy shirt and then a sil- <laughs> looks silky, waistcoat and cravat, all blue. But also, great news for the listener, Anthony and Benedict, I would say, have a similar vibe. They both have a formalish, slightly silky waistcoat and a necktie and a billowy armed white shirt. Now, apologies mm-hmm. to the Free the Neck campaign because we don't quite get the neck today, but stay this strong, everyone. We will get there one day. But it's great so to see nice. Colin, like, in his element in this scene, banter with his brothers but also coordinating with them as well it's great he is he is isn't he? i hope that we will see more of this in season three and less matchy matchy with little greg but i'd say that's a given <laughs> well we can only hope but like i was saying to lecky this is my all-time favorite colin scenes because it's just so lovely to see him having fun with his brothers yeah. letting loose a little bit even if colin's idea of letting loose is sipping steadily on drinks and giggling instead <laughs> of you know visiting brothels <laughs> attending orgies like his other two brothers <laughs> oh I think I'm with Colin on this one. <laughs> oh, I'm not. I'm not. <laughs> Look, I'm sat on the floor doing a podcast about a TV show. I'm definitely more with the Colin here. Um, and Luke actually specifically talked about how Colin's costuming in this scene really showed that. And he said that, to quote, the days we don't wear jackets are a real dream because when we're shooting in the studio, it gets quite hot. Anthony mm-hmm. always has to have his sleeves rolled up and Benedict is the arsy one so he gets to have different neckties and be quite quirky but mm-hmm. Colin is really just always done up. 
no way. We've never noticed me. <laughs> never noticed Luke. <laughs> <laughs> and then he went on to say that my character isn't much of a rebel. Apart from opium, but yeah. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah this is the thing. He's not a rebel, but he just is a bit of a druggie. Yeah. Well, I feel like it's one of those things where it's like, I wasn't really a rebel in high school because I like didn't get into fights. Like teachers weren't calling my family or anything. But bro, I partied. I partied. <laughs> I feel like it's like if you're not getting in the way of your parents and you're still doing the things that you need to do in order to make them happy, you're not necessarily a, a rebel, you know? But Colin doesn't even party. He, like, drinks opium tea and stares at grass. Yeah, he's depressed. <laughs> <laughs> oh, bless his heart. Sorry, continue. So it's a nice moment when Colin is more relaxed, like the bachelor drinks before the wedding. Now, I already know that this episode, being entirely focused on a wedding as it is, is going to make us spiral about the potential pollen wedding in season three. And we have talked about it many times before, especially about the filming leaks. So we'll try not to retread old ground too much, but it is a bit inevitable. So I have a quick question for you. Do you think we're going to get to see little stag do bachelor party regency drinks with the boys for colin and if so what's it gonna look like probably i hope that anthony is there but obviously it would depend on jonathan bailey's schedule because we know that he was shooting two shows at the same time um while this was mm. happening but he was there for like filming some things in the um the third and fourth blocks so maybe he could be out with five and the boys yeah i think it could be well i also think it could be something more like quiet with just benedict honestly i was gonna say i've never considered this but if he did have one i'd want it to be kind of quiet and then I'd want him to sneak out and go see Pen afterward and have Aww. kind of a little That's engagement That's honestly moment. what he says in my notes. <laughs> hey, I said that, like, for a start, I think he would be thrilled to be ma- to be getting married he'd, and he wouldn't shut up and he would be the guy who sneaks out of his own party yeah. to go and see Penn. It's like, I just missed you so much. And she's <laughs> like, I was trying to sleep. Go away, get that out of my window. That would be cute. That would be cute. But to continue, Ben and Colin play Love of Paul reflected enticingly in a mirror whilst they continue to jest with Anthony about his legacy of tyranny on the family. They raise a toast to Kate with Colin cheersing to Anthony, besting her and they all down their drinks with Colin coughing on his drink. I told you, it's complete lightweight. <laughs> For Ben and Colin, Ben, into giggles again. You're laughing now, babe, but that's going to be leaving you with one hell of a headache come morning. But whilst Colin is off drinking with his brothers, where's Penelope, Lucky? She's busy getting ready with her family over at the Featherington house. Portia attempts to prepare for the wedding by making sure Prudence's dress is low cut enough that her boo, sorry, oh. rubies are in display, <laughs> which I find very funny since a certain third born Bridgerton apparently takes notice of another Featherington girl's assets. Sorry, <gasps> accessories, despite her being much more covered up, which we'll get to very soon. My, 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 you are slipping today, Lucky. <laughs> Portia scheming as usual. You, we know she loves a scheme. So in this scene, Portia takes her previous idea about swindling investors in Jack's minds and runs with it and it just makes me wonder in season one Portia became involved in Marina's scheme to entrap a husband as well so will she become involved in a similar scenario in season three probably I don't want to bring it up again because it nearly tore us apart <laughs> but I think that she'll probably do some sort of scamming at the wedding oh, god damn it <laughs> she seems to be busy scheming <laughs> yeah I feel like she's gonna she's gonna come up with something because I mean they might have money but it's Portia you know if she's not trying does she need a subplot though uh, I wonder if she'll become involved in the Lady Whistledown drama. Maybe, somehow. maybe. Mm. Like, maybe she'll be a big, like, proponent of, like, trying to find out who it is. Like, or, I don't know, maybe if they flipped it. Oh my gosh, this would be terrible, but great for a TV. Maybe they'll flip it and Prudence will be the one that's like, I'm Lady Whistledown. And everyone will be like, what the <laughs> fuck? You know and what? they won't believe her, but what? I could see that because she keeps hinting throughout season two that she really wants Lady Whistledown to write about her. Yeah. <laughs> and then Portia helps Prudence and whatever. And then they find she finds out that it's actually Penn who's Lady Whistledown. That could be a really good way for them if they want to like move past Cressida. But I don't know. I still think it's going to be Cressida. But it would play up the comedy of Prudence was the one to be like, I'm Lady Whistledown, you guys. It's me. Or even for like a little second where mm-hmm. she's like, it's me. And then everyone just looks at her and they're like, no, it isn't. Just sit down, Prudence. Yeah. And she just kind of like yeah. slings back down. Mm-hmm. I think because she'll be involved with the main plot, she might not need a subplot. Yeah. yeah. And if we think like a lot of the Featherington subplots have been about getting Colin involved in the Featherington. Yes. Mm-hmm. If there's one thing he loves, he's like, I see a cousin. I see mm-hmm. a chance for me to get involved in Penn's life. Right. <laughs> there I am. Yes. And it's like, will they need that? But I do think that it's going to be super interesting if Portia finds out that Penelope is Lady Whistledown because I think she's going to be impressed. Mm-hmm. And I think she would... Because, like, she appreciates, like, a dirty tactic or two. Yeah. Yes. So I think she'd be impressed. And I think she'd try and protect Penn. Will Colin learn about Portia's scheming? Because this is the thing, like, he, he must know to an extent 
Because by the end of the season, he knows that Jack was scheming, but does he suspect that Portia was involved? I don't think he does. No. I don't think he did know that Portia was involved. And I feel like he needs to know Penn's secrets for them to get together. But at some point, he also has to learn about Portia Mm -hmm. because he was embroiled in both of her schemes. And that would be interesting. Yeah. (laughs) They're such a fine family. He really cares about them. (laughs) (laughs) And while Cousin Jack gets a tickle in his pickle, as Beans would say at Portia's scheming, (laughs) we find Penn hurrying downstairs to meet Jen. Yeah, this is a gorgeous outfit from Penn here, which she carries on wearing through the wedding and the purpose scene. This dress did really well in the outfit game on the subreddit, losing out only to the star's dress of 201 in round 34. That was when it was knocked out. So 34 rounds made it far. So this dress is a fan favourite shade of yellow. We like the like kind of buttercup side of things. And there's nice floral detailing, nice sleeves, cute gloves. Her hair's done mm-hmm. nicely and falling down around her back. But none of this matters to typical boy Mr. Colin Bridgerton now does it. No, no, dear listener, because this is the outfit that Penn is wearing when he notices her ruby necklace that he calls back to in 207. You see that little ruby necklace? Her boobs are pretty boobalicious here. So this is all the damning evidence we need that Colin was drawn to Penn's chest area and that's why he noticed the necklace. Colour me convinced. You can't talk me out of this. I can't believe that you are accusing Mr. Bridgerton of having wandering eyes. Tut, tut, bitch. He's a gentleman with a proven interest in gemology. I don't know how you can accuse him. And it's also, true. this necklace is blinding. I had to wear my sunglasses when I was watching this episode because it was so <laughs> ostentatious, so in your face that I'm sorry that it was just assaulting his eyes every time he looked at her. I don't know what you're talking about. Those rubies are truly exquisite. <laughs> I can't even see the rubies, honestly. <laughs> Get your mind out of the gut of the rest of you. But although we enjoy any excuse to hang out with Jen and Penn, Madame Delacroix is here for a reason. Penn has called Jen over to ask after Theo. You know, remember last episode, Penn followed Eloise the printers and was less than thrilled to learn about the two of them. And this whole thing sets off alarm bells in Jen's head. She doesn't think it's a good idea for them to meet so publicly. This is another sign of Penn's increasing recklessness. And Jen becomes worried that someone is onto them. She says, because if there's trouble on the horizon, I cannot be associated. My business is too important. This coupled Mm -hmm. with the crumb we received from one of our listeners about the printer filming multiple episodes in season three makes me wonder if it's possible that Jen might sever or limit her working relationship with Penelope next season, especially if Queen Charlotte is hunting Lady Whistledown more seriously. If Jen refuses to deliver issues of Lady Whistledown, this could force Penn to again have to sneak off to the printer by herself. This would not only allow them to adapt the book more closely, but also add some nice suspense with us fearing that Penn could be caught at the worst possible time, especially if there is some sort of bounty on her head. That's such a good point because I had a really considered the fact that the print being that I mean maybe he's just in like the old scene or two but it does make sense that if there's a bounty placed on anyone helping or if they just if it just gets into a frenzy where it's too dangerous to help Penelope mm-hmm. then yeah she's gonna have to go it alone again and go mm-hmm. back to more rustic means because we keep saying oh she might sleep out of a ball or something but that is modeled on the old early right. season two mm-hmm. of a model of how she carried out business as opposed to the latest one where she relied on Jen maybe Penelope asks Jen to stop because she doesn't want to place her friend in danger yeah that could be possible but you know who can blame jen for looking out for herself she has just as much to lose as penelope if not more she's a working class woman in the ton Mm -hmm. and not only has a business at risk but she also operates under a false identity and if she gets exposed it'll be devastating for her life she probably knows better than pen does about how to navigate a secret life whilst also practicing caution and knowing when not to go too far and when not to push it even though she was the one last week who was encouraging her to you know not limit her ambitions there's a Mm -hmm. difference between being entered Surprising and being reckless mm-hmm. and being arrogant like Penn is starting to veer off into. And yes, her, her business is benefiting, but enough to justify the increasing risks. You know, remember this whole business plan was Penn's idea. And also note how Penelope uses her lower register of voice here to talk serious business with Jen. It's a case where Penn is really trying hard to control the situation with Eloise. She's really trying to micromanage that, but it is starting to spiral. And just a quick shout that I really love how this scene is filmed where it circles around them again. And yeah. Even yeah. though it just make me slightly dizzy. <laughs> like you were saying, like, I do hope that Jen still sticks by her in season three even if she can't do it maybe overtly i really want to see their friendship develop and that's really all that's really the only person pen's got left 
left at the beginning of the series. So yeah, it's true. I don't want her to, to lose that. But they may still interact because of her wardrobe next season. Yes. Yeah, they might yes. not be. But I like the idea that there's going to be that pressure on everyone in Penelope's life and it's going to start coming down on her. But before the two can talk much further, they're interrupted by Portia, who is surprised to see the Medice there. And fortunately, Jen makes a quick excuse and bolts from the scene. Yeah. And Portia says, a woman running her own business. No wonder her mind is so scattered. I wonder if that might be a potential hint or kind of warning for a future mistake that Penn might make when she's caught up with some drama or just gets a bit too cocky like we've talked about or maybe distracted by her recent kissing. Entanglement. Careful, Penn. <laughs> it's a good point, Veg, because because the synopsis alludes to that, doesn't it? It alludes to her growing place in society. Yeah. Makes it a lot harder for her to keep control. That's true, yeah. Or whistle down. And we see in this season how her attempts to control the people around her and control Whistledown can sometimes have negative repercussions in her life and those around her and mm. next year that's going to go up on a whole other level. I feel like it's also applicable to this season where mm. Pe- Penn is so focused on the Eloise situation that she becomes so reckless that Eloise yeah. ends up finding mm-hmm. out. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But we've got a busy day ahead of us and surely the Bridgetons have a lot going on as well. Let's go check in on them. Well, if we go over to the Bridgerton entrance hall, we find the Bridgertons also getting ready to leave for the wedding, and Cullen is splayed out on what appears to be the <laughs> tiniest ever bench for a grown man to recline upon. Apparently, he has quite the hangover as well. I know. Like, if I was hungover, I'd be on the floor. <laughs> like, I wouldn't let, allow myself to be that uncomfortable in that tiny little bench. Yeah, but he's fancy. He's on, like, a He could be fancy bench. under the bench. <laughs> he should be under the table that's between yeah. him and Benedict. Yeah, and exactly. <laughs> You must be thrilled to see Colin suffering. This is your uh, some dreams really do come true. Not enough. I think you wish for a bit a bit more pain than just the hangover on the boy, don't you? And as Violet chastises the younger siblings, he says, Oh mother, please not so loud. He is not doing too great. And Violet looks less than impressed and tells Benedict, Whatever you've done to your brother, undo it. What's Benedict's remedy, Lecky? More drinking. Of course. If Colin stays drunk, he won't get a hangover. Infallible logic there, Ben. Hair of the dog. He's not wrong. He's not wrong. (laughs) Colin admits that he will never reach his brother's capacity for drink. And also this is the start of Colin constantly drinking throughout the second half of the season. I know we saw him with his tea in 203, but he really does end up drinking a lot. Almost every single time we see him from this point out, he's either drunk or downing drinks uh, like he does at the Featherington Ball, you know. You have an interesting point about this, Obs. I think you've compared his drinking to the Leander myth that we learned about in last season, right? Well, last season he was very quick to associate himself with the Leander myth in sort of a very romantic, idealised version of the myth that maybe isn't quite accurate. But I think in a really sad way, it's kind of come to fruition a little bit because, as we said last season, Leander is a story about someone who is about a man who gets lost Mm. and ends up drowning. Mm. And I think this is what we're seeing the ramifications of this season. You know, maybe he has started to move past the marina situation a little bit more, but it's left him in this state of limbo where he is still completely lost. Mm -hmm. He doesn't know what his next step forward is in life. He Mm -hmm. knows that he needs to try and move forward, but he doesn't know what that looks like. And he's kind of left drowning in a way. And as we said before, the only person who really notices is Penelope. Maybe... Penelope will be his guiding light. Yeah. But obviously, oh, oh. <laughs> with a happier ending, maybe she is his guiding light, leading him out out of this confusion that he yes. has regarding his purpose and his place mm-hmm. in life. And so in a really, really sad way, he has almost become his Leander. You know, he was lost at sea and now he's drowning his sorrows. And is there anyone to help pull him out of it? We'll have to find out. Yeah. So do you feel bad for Colin yet? Well, you know, like, I can... You know, you shouldn't. Oh, that's a ringing endorsement. <laughs> Hope he doesn't become an alcoholic. You know. <laughs> okay, so our boy's hungover. He's suffering. But how's he looking? He's looking quite smart. Um, he and Benedict are wearing mm-hmm. matching suits with white waistcoat and cravat. And he's wearing a wedding outfit, page boy. It's not page boy. Usher, whatever you call. <laughs> Definitely an usher. But is, is this a sneak peek into his wedding outfit? Beans, lovely beans, crumbed cream beans. A wee wee. Did we see any potential Colin sightings at the wedding filming? Do we know what he might be wearing? Yeah, there was a glimpse of Luke Newton that was seen through the tiniest little crack in a door. I think he was wearing blue, somebody said? Yes, like a yellowy cream. A yellow waistcoat, a blue sort of cravat situation, Mm -hmm. a dark jacket. It's not the white and black tux that we get here. Right. It's going in a very different direction. I think that's he's going to be handsome. Dankworth was also matching, which adds to our little theory that if Prudence marries Dankworth, and if this is a 
Penn and Colin wedding, then Dankworth would be part of the wedding party. Yeah. I think yes. Benedict was also spotted and he was also in the same kind of Color scheme. attire, if you will. Yeah, so everybody was there, but Colin specifically, yeah, we got a, we got a little glimpse of him. I think he's going to look handsome. And we will get onto it later because almost everyone was spotted at their wedding, except for someone who has caused quite a stir, but we will get there. We've got to get to the bloody wedding first, to be honest. <laughs> yes, I know we have a wedding to get to, but... Yeah, we do, hurry up. <laughs> Lecky, I know the two of us have a special bond, but you cannot keep pulling me into the circus tent like this. <laughs> Why are we here again? <laughs> the actress we mentioned in our last episode, Sarah Junion, she walks through the background of this scene as it's opening. Oh, she does. In the shot, you have Gregory and Hyacinth running in the background, mm -hmm. and it's kind of playful, and you kind of see all the Bridgerton family together and I think it's because you don't really see Gregory and Hyacinth later at the wedding but why are they taking the time to <laughs> showcase this one maid? She does kind of walk straight through the shot doesn't she? Yeah and I mean there are a few other maids that you can kind of glimpse throughout this um the shot and this entire scene. I just feel like it's just a little too covert or maybe not covert enough. Something about it just stands out a little too much. Lefty, are you saying that she has presence yes yes <laughs> our favorite clowning yeah the maid with presence is here yeah the thing is with this episode lecky since we're clowning i've got my face paint on i'm ready the thing with this episode is it's there's a lot of intentionality in how it's shot that's true we've got our favorite duo don't we we've got tom Verica, we've got jeffrey joe mm -hmm. both working together we saw last season and later on in this episode how so many of these shots are beautifully composed but also very intentionally composed yes there's there's almost a choreography to this scene yeah in the flow of it which feels like every mm -hmm. part is a moving piece that is telling a story that's a good way to describe it and to have this character move through that story feels incredibly mm -hmm intentional. Yes, and what I like is that she walks behind Ben and Benedict is mm. drinking from his flask and I, I kind of like this that he's drinking so he's kind of distracted and it's not until he lowers the flask that she exits the frame. She exits like literally <gasps> almost at that exact moment and it just yeah. plays so much into this, their story about him not being able to see what's right in front of him because he's so distracted by other things. She's literally moving behind him, she's moving past him and he does <laughs> A Bridgerton it. family trait ever <laughs> he doesn't regain awareness until she just the moment she exits the frame the moment she exits the room and correct me if i'm wrong although i don't think you're going to correct me because you're clowning just as hard as i am but she passes violet in this moment yes and she almost turns to nod at her or has this moment of acknowledgement whereas other maids just seem to brush past yeah she does nod at violet and i mean it just could be like showing deference or, or something like that but I don't really pay attention to other maids you know nodding or you know acknowledging Violet or the other Bridgertons like that usually and you know in their book Violet and Sophie kind of have a, a special relationship so they, it was a very close bond don't they yeah at the very end of this sequence you can see all the Bridgertons um, there's like a shot from above as they're getting ready to mm. leave for the wedding and you see this maid pulling out Eloise's cloak like she holds it out for for Eloise to kind of step into and what I like is that Benedict again walks past her he doesn't notice her because he's making a he's so close to her he's so close to her if we're wrong about this it's gonna be so funny lucky <laughs> It's, it's fine. What it's else fine. are we going to do to pass this time? <laughs> but he, he's making a beeline for Colin. No pun intended, Edmund. Sorry. And he has one arm open. He's going to embrace Colin. It looks like they're both kind of going to embrace a sibling. <gasps> they both have open arms. They're near each other, but they're not interacting with each other. I just want to get them and turn them 90 degrees. They'd be like, hug each other. Yeah. yeah, they'd be hugging. <laughs> um, <laughs> but yeah, it's, it's a good little shot. We'll be sharing some pictures and videos at some point. We'll see if you agree with us. You know you will. And before we leave the tent, Lecky, this is strange to think that is that we're expecting filming on season four to possibly <laughs> begin before season three is released. Yes, definitely. Which means, are they going to announce the cast? If it is Ben's season, are they going to try and conceal Sophie? Or are they going to have to announce her? I feel like they would try to conceal her just because we haven't seen season three yet. And if if this maid is Sophie, I mean, like, mm. if anyone is Sophie, honestly, they're probably going to yeah. try to hide her until season three is released. Or maybe they'll announce her casting, like, right before the show comes out or something like that to kind of hype it. Yeah. But yeah, I, I don't think they're going to want people with uh, drones no. <laughs> around when they begin shooting season four. No. 
going to need some bigger fences, Lucky, I think. Uh-huh. Or, or bigger buses. Well, dear <laughs> listeners, some of you are on board with our theory. Some of you are laughing at us in our faces. Either way, let us know what you think as we continue our Sophie Beckett watch. I can't see I'm really the looking for Sophie Beckett, Beckett anywhere. Can you tell me where, where she has is? Where Sophie Beckett gone? I don't even really know who she is, but I'm looking for her. I'm telling you, let us know if you're on our Eloise made train because we are flying full speed at that brick wall that's ahead of us. I think <laughs> you guys are clowning a bit too close to the sun here, but... Spiralling. <laughs> But we are finally making it inside the church. St. James on Piccadilly, if you're a fan of filming locations. I went in there early this year to have a nosy at the location and I ended up having to stay for, do you remember this? I had to stay for an hour because I walked in and there was a piano concert taking place and they're like, oh. sit down. And I just had to sit there. It's kind of like a Smythe Smith musical moment where you just got trapped. For <laughs> age, honestly. And I was sat there like, I need, I had things to do today and I just had to stay there. But <laughs> Colin and Eloise are both chatting with the couple before Penn happily bounds over and interrupts them, saying it's a wonder that she found them both amidst all the opulence. Whistledown is watching and taking notes, I see. But I just adore moments like these. We saw it in 2042 when she ran down the hill where Penn Penelope spots the two people that she loves most in the entire world and she just goes straight for them and it just must make her little heart sing when she sees them both which is such a lovely thought until you realise that in only a couple of episodes time she's not going to have either of them anymore. Oh. So uh, a little cheerful thought to get you into the wedding spirit. <laughs> and the poor couple that Colin and Eloise were talking to get ditched without a word. We know that Colin has zero etiquette when it comes to ditching people for pen and the look on his face as he turns to her my word <laughs> he is thrilled to see his pen and just a reminder for everyone that colin is either tipsy or actually drunk throughout this whole thing the whole wedding so every sacred pollen interaction we get today drunk purpose drunk staring at penelope's exquisite necklace drunk <laughs> the boys inhibitions are down and you know what i feel like a scientist because this gives us some fascinating results <laughs> like here for example where the two of them just embark on this completely incomprehensible discussion about mm -hmm. the plight of mankind <laughs> pen muses that the queen's trying to prove herself significant and equal to the task colin is loving it they're having like this <laughs> little philosophical discussion together yeah. and they're in this own little world completely vibing on the same wavelength looking equally enthralled by what the other is saying i think they both think that they're the most fascinating people they've ever met in their entire life mm -hmm. and i honestly think that this is exactly what their letters actually sounded like same colin's inhibitions is a little bit lowered and yeah. i think that is the same yeah. as him writing to her mm -hmm. that's yeah, a good point so. just complete incomprehensible nonsense about philosophy <laughs> This whole conversation is interesting to me because it hints that Colin may handle the Lady Whistledown reveal better than we might expect because he agrees with Penn that the plight of mankind is to prove themselves significant, adding that one must make a name for oneself if this life is to mean anything at all. So clearly Colin is desperately searching for his purpose, but these words also kind of scream Lady Whistledown at me. Penn's mm -hmm. cause is somewhat problematic, but she deals in truths. She does not lie. And she's obviously made a name for herself with Lady Whistledown. It is like a massive undertaking that she's doing. I mean, you have to respect what she does it's just sometimes she doesn't go about it in the best way so I think he will be impressed by that kind of side of her as well yeah and I as you said this is similar to the scene with Penn running down the hill to them and yeah. I raved about it then and I'll rave about this scene I love how she is in this scene she acts so cool and so friendly and so comfortable and I, I'm just so obsessed um I will say though when he starts talking about making a name for oneself she does stare at him kind of googly-eyed and it is a wonder that Eloise yeah, is completely there. oblivious to anything on either way I can't wait for the season three googly eyes and for Lecky's edits of all the googly eyes to every song that exists in the world about googly eyes. <laughs> it will give me googly eyes. Mm. Thank you. Lecky, you've got work to do. <laughs> Eloise, ever the cock block, tells Penn not to indulge him and she posits that this insufferable version of Colin is either down to Grease or Lady Crane, the two things that we probably don't need to hear about ever again <laughs> and they've been haunting us all season. But our boy in a moment of character growth dismisses both Grace and Lady Crane, he just brushes right on past them and gets on his purpose train, just like you say, Lek. Penn tells him that he has a noble pursuit. His praise kink is flying high in the sky. And what's <laughs> our reward? <laughs> he says that Penn and Eloise could not be less alike. So for the marinas amongst you who think that Colin sees Penn as his sister, here is proof that he is starting to see them as completely different. Mm -hmm, yes. And thank God. So he declares that Penn, unlike Elle, has sense. So do we think that Colin <laughs> will regret these words in season three? Will he approve of Penn's sensible plan to marry herself off? It's a splendid plan. I think he's 
just going to be so panicked. He'll be like, yes, whatever you say is the best plan I've ever heard in my entire life. <laughs> then it'll, he'll realise too late. He might not agree with it, but he'll probably be like, yeah, no, that is sensible. Fair enough. <laughs> it's just not sensible for my heart. Oh, oh bless his little soul. <laughs> Very fittingly, he pulls out his flask, takes a swig, and heads back to his seat at the front of the church. And as Penelope's also make their way to their seats, Penn basically strong arms Elle into admitting that she's been seeing Theo again. When Penn asks if it's just a friendship, Elle replies by saying, of course, what else could it be? But later in the same episode, we see Elle starting to realize that she may have deeper feelings for Theo. And these words... What else could it be so closely mirrors Penn and Colin's own story, yeah. especially this season when Penn is left constantly questioning what exactly is going on between them. And Eloise's words throughout this episode have this kind of double meaning and they resonate so much with Penn and that's what makes this sabotaging cut just a little too deeply here because she has firsthand experience of being in this sort of position of having feelings beyond friendship and not knowing what to make of them. Well, I do think when I watched this scene, in fact, everything that really carries on from this point forward with Eloise and Penn is like Penn's pretty in the wrong to try and sabotage her best friend's romantic interests right yes. yeah she can see that Eloise is genuinely feeling what she I mean she's working through it she's processing it she doesn't really know what to call it or anything like that but it's very genuine what Eloise is expressing and Penelope as her best friend is just trying to turn her against it at every turn for her own interests mm -hmm. and Eloise's words here where she's you know saying of course it's a friendship what else could it be almost sounds like what Colin will be processing next year which makes me mm -hmm. think that the Bridgerton miscomprehension of friendship is clearly genetic <laughs> but inside the church, the wedding begins and we get a lovely instrumental Harry Styles sign of the times. What are our two resident romantics doing, Lek? Well, Colin has the biggest smile on his face as Antony walks down the aisle. <laughs> he loves weddings. We saw it at Daphne's wedding as well. Uh, Luke Newton said he actually got caught up in the emotion in the scene and decided to play it off as Colin just really loving weddings, mm -hmm. which completely tracks for his character. <laughs> it makes me think about how Colin will probably end up crying at his own wedding. Aww. Yes, someone uh, messaged us on Instagram asking if we think he'll cry during the wedding. And yeah. I was like, he'll he's stop. bloody better because he's cried everyone else's. <laughs> yeah. But Obs, I think it was you who pointed out this to me, but just before Antony walks down the aisle, it almost looks like Penelope is looking over at Colin. Aww. Yes, she is. Yeah, if you, if you look really, really carefully, like we have spent hours doing because there's nothing else to do, she is definitely looking in his direction. I suppose you could argue she's looking at Eloise, but come on, it's a wedding. She's romantic. We all know what she's thinking. <laughs> I just love the idea that she's drawn to him in this cute little moment. And it got me thinking, who would Colin's best man be at his wedding? Because Anthony's best man is Benedict. Benedict again. <laughs> when you've got that many brothers, it's hard to choose. It'd be cute if it was Gregory. Little Greg. <laughs> yeah, but I have a feeling it'll be Benedict again. Yeah. What's always, Anthony gonna do? Always a man of honor never the man <laughs> in honor oh, always the bridesmaid bless him <laughs> but what would Anthony do then I know there's a theory that Anthony could walk Penn down the aisle but I think Portia would do that yeah I don't Portia know. would also probably like to show off yes a hundred percent yeah of course she would she like her little moment in the spotlight also touch on this a little bit earlier but who would Penn's bridesmaids be because there was a lot of spiraling by fans at the time because Claudia Jesse was not seen on set That's true at the wedding and it started yeah. up this theory that Eloise is going to refuse to go to the wedding maybe or maybe she she just wasn't noticed. Maybe she slipped in. Yeah. Or if there's if it's gonna be like a Porsche's day instead of like a Penn's day, I feel like she would force Prudence and uh, Philippa to be her bridesmaids. I don't think they can be though, because they've both been married by then. I think in Regency, your bridesmaids have to be actual maids, oh. like maidens. Oh, in Regency, who fucking cares? What we'd say about the filming leaks is that. A lot of filming's taken place that we had no idea of, and a lot of people can be on set without anyone knowing. So, mm -hmm. although Claudia Jesse wasn't seen at the wedding, me and Veg both kind of saw some of that filming taking place, and it would have been very easy for no one to have noticed that she was there. I don't think that Hannah Dodd was spotted either, but the actor for John was spotted. So, I don't know. I think I wouldn't spiral too much about Eloise not going to their wedding. I think she will go to the wedding. I'm hoping she'll be bridesmaid. On the same topic, I believe that Obs kind of hopes that we'll see a tense moment where Penn and Colin lock eyes at Fran and John's wedding, which we think is the yes. first wedding of next season um, based of based on what we've seen in the leaks. But because of this mm -hmm. scene, I think it could be interesting if here we have Penn watching Colin, but in season three, could we have Colin watching Penn at the first wedding without mm. her realizing it? And then we could finally have that moment of connection at their own wedding where they finally get to stare in each other's eyes. Obviously, I'm totally conning, but it could be super romantic. I like that. I really want the first wedding where, like you say, it's John and Francesca getting married. And you know that thing that happens in movies and TV shows where two characters who like are in a difficult romantic situation go to someone else's wedding and they like look at each other as if to be like that should be us getting married up there uh -huh. 
and it's so super, cute. super angsty <laughs> and it's heartbreaking and it's set against us. But then I was also thinking, imagine if Michael's in the mix as well. So you've got oh, yeah. Michael watching Fran and John get married mm-hmm. and he's all like agony. And then you've got Penn and Colin like agonizing. I just want a Fran wedding. Actually, Veg was there around that time and she thinks she saw somebody yes. who could have been Michael filming around that yeah. same time. Interesting. Yeah. Eyes on the ground. I also, before the wedding thing, that we saw being filmed, I did Mm -hmm. see a group of girls, and I'm sure I sent Beans the pictures, but there was so much stuff that I'd have to go through. There were women in matching bridesmaidy style dresses, like pre that wedding scene. Mm Oh, so it could be bridesmaids for the Fron wedding. Is it it Fron? Fron, Fron, We'll go with Fron, the Fron wedding. Sounds like too much like prawn. I can't, I can't. Says the fandom called Pollen. Come on, Pollen's Lucky. adorable. How about Dran? Dran. 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 It's such a short relationship that they don't even have a pit or have a name because he dies so quickly. <laughs> but getting back to our current wedding at hand, Penn is also keeping a close eye on things as any good gossip writer would, and the wedding kicks off and it pretty quickly crashes and burns. Mm. Yes. After watching Benedict make some hilarious faces when the Archbishop mentions carnal lusts and appetites, and you know, Edwina taking off like a bat out of hell, <laughs> we see the Bridgerton clan rallying around Antony. And Colin sweetly tries to comfort Antony by saying that Edwina has a delicate constitution and may have been overwhelmed. Poor Antony. He just gets completely bombarded on all sides. And Eloise gets into a snipey exchange with Colin where he says, do you always have to be so you? Yeah. And, and Eloise says, would you rather be married and silent and I think this not only reminds us that they have a very prickly relationship with each other particularly this season it's far more noticeable than it was last season but again does make us think back to how Eloise's perception of marriage Mm -hmm. as being silenced could be changed by watching Colin and Penn go through marriage themselves. Meanwhile Penn is outside listening to the rumour mill. Fife also walks by martini in hand. Got to say didn't mention it during the actual wedding ceremony itself but Fife is living for the drama. (laughs) Watch him at the wedding. He's I'm amazed that he doesn't like push his way towards the front he's absolutely (laughs) soaking in the tea he has the best reactions beyond possibly prudence with the fireworks which always steals that scene but this is his kind of day and speaking of rumor mills there's planted stories out in full force as penelope quietly weaves her way through listening and being noticed by no one she gets so many snippets of all the different stories as well that it surely makes this harder to track the actual leak Mm -hmm. down to one person and also i feel as if she's like very discerning with the difference between what she hears and what she prints i think she has a good way to judge what's true and what isn't what she should reveal what she should withhold Mm -hmm. and although the queen is trying to trap her i think you know the queen works hard but whistledown works harder and she's got a bit of a win up on this one Mm -hmm. and portia is busy berating prudence for not showing off her ruby necklace again pen doesn't even (laughs) have to try but i digress in this exchange portia tells prudence to do what she says lest she be left without any prospects like penelope portia clearly has no hope that pen will ever attract attention from a man completely oblivious (laughs) that colin has been checking out pen at this very wedding checking out her necklace Lucky, please. I'm not having this decrying of his honor. He's looking at the exquisite necklace. And if it just so happens to be near her chest, then I'm sorry, but that's just how some coincidence in life works, isn't it? (laughs) Okay, look, I need your help with this one. Okay. A difficult moment for me. I think you know this is a difficult moment for me. It's my favorite episodes, but with joy comes tragedy and it's gonna be very difficult for me to talk about so can you please take over whilst i go cry in the corner thank you yes so pollen fans everywhere more and as we cut to our next pollen scene <gasps> could be the operative word there <laughs> We catch the tail end of what appears to be a deleted scene here, which you can see Nick, Newts, and Claudia rehearsing in behind-the-scenes footage that we will share for anyone who hasn't seen it. Okay, so if you haven't seen it, just to give you a little bit of context about this, it was shown in behind-the-scenes footage, and what it is, it's a scene that takes place, it's literally cut from what we see here. So just beforehand, Colin walks up to Penelope, who's standing by herself, and starts talking with her. We've no idea what they were talking about. I would pay so much money that I don't have to find out what (laughs) you want to know what was in their letters I want to know what was in this deleted Mm. scene it haunts me because I think and yeah it was probably cut because it wasn't needed to tell their story and they have bigger moments later in the episode but there's something about the fact that Colin goes up to Penelope that I think is actually very important for their story and Mm -hmm. it's such a shame that it gets cut he goes up to her they have a conversation and Eloise completely swoops in it's you see like it's one smooth move where she just loops Penn's arm and snatches (laughs) her away and Colin looks visibly 
annoyed by it. He's yes. like, fuck's sake, can't have anything. Penn doesn't look too thrilled either. And it's an absolute tragedy that it was taken from us and that we don't know what happened. But at least we do have, which we will share, the behind the scenes visual joy of them rehearsing, which puts Colin in a very fuzzy robe and Penn in sunglasses and a hairnet <laughs> starting yes. it out. Epitome of style. <laughs> Hopefully one day we will get the answers we are so hoping for in this life. Well, what we do get is the end of the scene where we see Colin looking very put out as Elle drags Penn off for yet another chat about her friendship with Theo. And there is a well-known photo that was released that shows Colin's reaction a bit more clearly, so we'll share that as well. It's a publicity style, and Fife is also... And Fife is in the background! And he's... He's taking a peek at the drama going He's on. He's watching it. <laughs> so this bloody deleted scene not only had Colin approaching Penn, the two of them probably... Do you know what was in their scene? I bet they were, like, recalling from start to finish every single thing they ever talked about in those bloody letters. Oh. <laughs> I bet that was in the scene. It was everything. And Fife would have been there with his martini in hand, sipping away, <laughs> and it's gone. That might have been setting up to await him yeah. further taking notice and pollen. Yeah. yeah. Please, Bridget and Gods, can someone just... <laughs> just, it. just let us know. Just so we can move on with our lives. But Cockblock Elle must do her duty and so off Penelope is dragged. You know, she thought that she was rescuing her bestie from the boring drone of her brother's stories. If only you knew Elle. You know, make no wonder we need Elle and Penn to break up in 208 because <laughs> Colin have got no chance of getting together if she's around. <laughs> so Elle and Penn begin chatting and Elle's speech here about her feelings obviously resonates very deeply with Penn. Mm -hmm. Elle states that it's the not knowing that feels like torment and how she's been turning over in her mind various conversations, examining the quote evidence and she still is isn't sure exactly what the nature of the relationship is. And as Nick has told us, Penn thought that this season was her love story. So we know that these same thoughts were likely running through Penelope's head during this season and in this scene as she gazes over at Colin, who again is standing with Fife. <gasps> yeah, and her look over at him after Al talks about the torment of... Mm -hmm. I completely forgot that that look mm, exists. Gorgeous. And this yeah. was my exact noise. <laughs> <laughs> you uh you malfunction <laughs> i was like oh my god i want that look every reverse fucking episode next season i want Aww. it double triple quadruple quintuple sex in a carriage from, from colin Septuple. i love it and just this little interlude i can't really explain why but that shot where it cuts away to colin just standing with his friends like you know this this is my favorite yes. shot of colin ever he looks so so sweet. He's just so happy. He loves your wedding. He's he's loving the wedding. Colin he loves lo a wedding. And this entire moment, the one that you were talking about, Veg, is just so gorgeously shot. And I think it perfectly encapsulates how Penn has loved him all this time. You know, at a distance, he doesn't know because of a conversation with Eloise, where Eloise's rhetoric very much goes into Penn's mind about being uncertain and having all this evidence. You know, for Penn, it's having the letters, it's having these conversations, having those difficult moments like you do not count or the beat in the bee scene. And she just doesn't know where they are with it. And I think it's yeah. so well done here by Nick because it's that gorgeous combination of wistful, yearning, adoring, and veg, I completely agree. Having the inverse of this is going to be delicious. Mm -hmm. And Penelope says that she hasn't felt like that and she could only imagine such a thing. And, you know, mm. forget whistle down because this right here is the biggest lie she's ever told. <laughs> this is pretty much the first and only time that Ella's I think, yes. ever really asked about Penelope's romantic interest. Mm -hmm. And I think she would collapse on the spot or maybe go running off throwing <laughs> up if Penn told her she was in love with Colin. So Penn might lie to Eloise about many things, but I don't blame her for lying about this one. After a couple of segues, namely where Portia encourages Jack away from the Bridgertons, insisting it's not affection but strategy that motivates her, and another mm. moment where Violet and Lady Danbury have an apparently hilarious exchange about peacocks, <laughs> we find ourselves in the purpose scene. Celebration, jubilation, we are here. <laughs> Every single moment of this scene is perfection. Yes. The acting, the script, the direction, lighting, Chef's cinematography, kiss. editing, catering, yep. scoring, weather. It's timeless. Mm -hmm. It's divine. Thank you to everyone who made this possible. We love you very much. This is the scene because we're back in the gardens as Penelope walks alone alongside that massive, very pale yellow wedding cake. More on that later. And um. spots her Colin. She immediately has the biggest smile on her face as she walks mm -hmm. over to him. And, you know, what's Colin doing that's enchanted her so dearly? <laughs> he's downing more of his hip flask. <laughs> oh, well. And I would think, surely he should have a little bit more discretion. He's a Bridgerton at a Bridgerton wedding that's absolutely gone to shit. And he's just there like, yeah, it's fucked. <laughs> he's like, I'll just down my drink. To his credit, Fife's walking around sipping a martini. So <laughs> <laughs> He is. Get your drinks, my love. But he doesn't care and neither does Penn because she looks completely enamoured. And she asks if it's a celebratory drink for him succeeding in finding what he's looking for in life. I'm like, fucking hell, Penn. Give him a chance, babe. Like, you literally talk <laughs> about this an hour ago 
<laughs> just give him a second. In fairness, I think she's good at recognizing when Colin is feeling more playful. Yeah, and you know, she's trying to lift his spirits up a little bit and without yeah. kind of dragging down a little bit. And Colin replies, only if whatever I'm looking for can be found at the bottom of this flask. And we all collectively scream at the screen that if he just looked slightly next to the flask in hand, he'd find exactly what he's been looking for. I have to give a quick shout out to one of my favourite Colin gazes ever, which is that moment when he looks at her and starts screwing up the lid of his flask. And he's so playful, again, he's pretty tipsy, as she approaches him. It just shows again how much he loves being around her and how confident she is in going up to him and knowing that at this point, he's not going to reject her publicly in that kind of situation. He's definitely charmed by her in this scene. Mm -hmm. From start to finish. Penna shows him that he will find his purpose one day. And if you remember, we discussed this a little bit last week's episode, that this search for purpose is something that's lifted pretty much directly from Colin's book. And in fact, this entire scene has a lot of similarities to the discussion that Penelope and Colin have during the scene where Penelope reads his journal and Colin cuts his hand, albeit the tone of the scene is very, very different. But just as in the books, Colin asks Penelope if she's found her purpose, to which she says that she hasn't. The two of them turn together as Pen begins this beautiful speech and they gaze out across the scene before for them. And Lecky, what exactly are they looking at? We've touched on this cake scene before, but just to briefly revisit, Penn has a conversation with Marina in season one where sex and love are associated with cake. Yeah. And here, Colin <laughs> basically suggests that he and Penn grab a slice. Moreover, Colin. the cake. <laughs> Forget the ruby. <laughs> Forget... <laughs> Moreover, the cake is resting on what looks like a carriage. It has wheels. And there's also an interesting shot where Paul and look over at the cake and you can see the wedding cake framed between them, which is interesting. Yes. It could be foreshadowing their eventual wedding. It's gorgeously, gorgeously framed between them. And the cake is also reminiscent of another important wedding cake in the story. St. Bride's, anyone? Mm -hmm. The framing of them talking about their purpose and their future as they look at a wedding cake is just my favourite piece of foreshadowing ever. And Penn has a gorgeous speech here about what she imagines her purpose to be. She says, But I imagine it to be something both animating and satisfying, the type of venture that speaks not to who I am, but rather who I am to be. What is her purpose then? Is it Whistledown and she's lying here to Colin? Is her purpose that she's talking about about marrying him? Is it a combination of everything? Does she really know what she wants her future to be at this point? And do you think that Colin is going to remember this speech? Like we're hoping that he's going to remember her assuredly, fervently, loudly in season three? I think it's a combination of everything. And mm. I do think that Colin will remember this scene. Yeah, hopefully. Yeah, I hope so. I think we're all sort of works in progress, I think. And I think that some of it, yeah, I guess Lady Whistledown. But I don't want to think that her whole life is just going to be this thing that she started when she was 18. <laughs> but yeah, as you say, like it's a combination of everything. And I feel like the purpose should just be satisfaction with your life and finding someone you want to be with and live your life with and just enjoy whatever happens in your life, even if that isn't yeah. some big adventure or... Yeah, that's a good point. I think I've said before that his purpose, one of them, is to end up with Penelope, but mm -hmm. that's not the summary of his entire life. He's, right. he's destined for yeah. more. But like, I like what you said about being fulfilled mm -hmm. is kind yeah. of your purpose. Yeah, I like that. And I think it's what Nicola herself has said that she wants Penelope to have everything. She wants her to yeah. have yeah. the career and living that side of your dreams whilst also having love. It's having like a fulfilled life. And I think Colin isn't really in the headspace to understand that just yet, although Penelope is going to help him in the scene because he's still pushing back from love so he's very like business strategy which we're gonna see in him pursuing the minds and everything and I think he deals with this a lot in his book as well where you know he tells Penelope because there's a point where he's worried about his purpose and Penelope tells him like you've got me and he says to her that isn't what I mean and she's like no I know that that's not what you mean I know that you want a full life as well with me as a part of it so yeah and I like the idea that Penn doesn't really quite know yet what that would look like for her I think she has ambitions and dreams and she knows what she wants the journey to do to her she wants to become brave and witty and she wants to escape her mama and she wants to be free and I think that's more yeah. the vehicle to her becoming her full self and everything yeah. in that little speech show is quite reminiscent of the journey she's probably going to be going on in the next season and going to have to learn to be as brave and witty in public as she is on the inside or how she channels that through Whistledown and um, she's going to try and break free from her mama and I think a lot of Penelope's journey is understanding what it means to be set free mm -hmm. and what that looks mm -hmm. like in her life Yeah, but I think that Colin is listening very closely to what she's saying in the scene and I think he's gonna take it very much to heart. We should also speak about the gazes here. So <gasps> the gazes are off the chart. <laughs> so we said during our 108 rewatch that the way that Colin looked at Penelope in that scene felt like a buildup of how he looks at her here. He has mm -hmm. so much wonder and looks at her almost in awe. Colin is often surprised by Penelope either yeah. because of her wit or moments like these where she just really seems to teach him something. Mm -hmm. You can almost see his world shift when he's watching. Yes. I mean, I think I think Luke actually like does this turn as he's watching her. Like his entire body shifts as he looks at her. And what I 
love is that Penelope is gazing out ahead of her. She's not looking at him. But he's looking at her. But he's looking at her. She has no idea that as she's talking about this future that she's imagining for herself, this world that she doesn't really share. Because with Eloise, she's always had to contain that part of her. She's always had to temper what she wants from the world, at least when she's verbalizing it to Eloise. So there's this moment where I think she's speaking completely honestly and completely freely. And she's not looking at him. She's just being herself. And he is completely enthralled by her. I was reading this article with Nicola last night where she said that Penelope is her truest self with Colin. Yes. And you see that in this scene. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Do you think this is the moment that really changes things for Colin? I think the point of their relationship is that she does creep up on him slowly. So it's, it's a buildup of moments, right? It's everything. It, it's those moments, like even from Byron to What a Barb, yeah. that then gets built on by 108 to their letters. Mm-hmm. It's all building and building and building. But do you think this is a bit of a turning point for him? I think this is a massive turning point because some of my favorite scenes in the next episode, he's so much more affectionate with Penn. Yeah. And there's just something that fundamentally changes in all of yeah. their interactions from this point forward. Chaos Colin, I think you'll find, is uh, <gasps> is the terminology. <laughs> it just activates something in, in him that it does give this completely different energy to how he is with her from this point on. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I'll save my negative thoughts for the end. <laughs> mm-hmm. I'll keep it positive. I l- I'm obsessed with the way he says, your dreams are grander than you let on, Penn. Yes. Like the way he says pen. He likes that pen. It's so soft. This is the best pen in the whole series. Oh, I'm holding a pen right now. How appropriate. She's there with us. <laughs> this is the best pen. It's just purple affection. And I love it so much. And I want to hear <laughs> that exact pen in that exact same tone as he like desperately tries to undo the buttons on her dress in the carriage. They don't even need to record it again. They just get this clip from the scene of him saying pen. <laughs> <laughs> just cut and paste. <laughs> it can't be improved. I also love this line and the way he looks at her because it is like his world has been opened to this other yes. side of Penn, the depths she has. Yeah. And if you think about it, before this season, they connected on this really deep level through their mm-hmm. letters, yes. but it's in person for mm-hmm. the first time, not via the page. Because Penelope, you know, she dismisses her dreams as mere fantasies, but she reminds him that you must allow ourselves those private moments so we may face reality armed with our reveries. And that is just a gorgeously poetic line. That's writer Penn, right? in that moment Mm -hmm. that's someone who struggles to publicly convey herself in the way that she can through her pen but I think in this moment they just could like you say like they connect and I think maybe we're thinking of a similar interview because one of my favorite interviews with Nicola is where she says you know she muses on Penelope's love for Colin she says that she's completely besotted with him but she finds a very deep authenticity in the way that Penelope loves him and she says that Penelope really truly sees Colin but also he in a way really truly sees her I don't think they Mm -hmm. have to pretend around one another and I think this is really what we're seeing here that Colin feels seen in this moment and that act of someone recognizing you and seeing you for who you are and really understanding the way that you see the world because I don't think this is just about Colin's fears I think it's about how he sees the world as they were talking about earlier in the church Mm. I think Penn's voice too here you know we talked earlier about her voice with Genevieve how it was in the low register I think this is Penn's actual proper voice I think this is Penelope and we don't always get to see that we don't always get to see her really verbalize how she truly sees the world and yeah I think that Colin is so struck by this side of her but also feeling seen within that moment by her and I think he's so drawn to that side of her like at the end of 108 where she put into words his experience without belittling him or dismissing his feelings complete Mm -hmm. validation Veg I think you talked before about that being such an important foundation in any love you know having someone who sees you for who you truly are that's the foundation of everything and I think that's the foundation Mm -hmm. that Penelope wants to skip ahead and get to all the good stuff but Mm -hmm. I think it's important that for Colin that he has that solid ground for them Mm -hmm. so we have a lot of talk about dreams and fantasies here Mm mm-hmm and we talked a lot about that before because it's come up a couple of times yeah like last Marina's season Marina's hinted 204 yeah exactly and we've talked about it before but I wonder if because he's airlifted the specific words technically when he says not in your wildest fantasies five and I wouldn't dream of courting so I'll get into my full rant later but he says <laughs> fantasies same word he says I wouldn't dream yes. same word do we think she is with him subconsciously in that moment do we think that her words are now in his vocabulary you guys don't look convinced (laughs) 
I think it's fascinating because I don't think it's a coincidence at all that their story's been so heavily layered with yeah. languages, dreams, dreams and fantasy. And, yeah. But I think what's really frustrating for Colin in this part of the story is that we have to remember that to, for Penn and Colin, actually, both of their ideas of this connotation of fantasies has been contaminated Marina. and yeah, tainted yes, by, by Marina because she used those exact words against both of them. And I think that we see the effects of that in the way that Penn is damaged by it and the way that Colin reacts against it. So I think Colin has this innate reaction to you know he she says to Penn that her love is a fantasy and she says to Colin that he is a boy caught up in his fantasies mm. because we know from a little bit later on that he is thinking about the conversation with Marina when they're having this conversation so I think the whole idea of love for Colin and being seen as an adult and being ready for love is still affected by that so I think he's so struck by it here but it is very very twisted that, that their words here gets used against yeah. her later on. That's brutal. I do agree. But what I will say with this scene is that one of Colin's biggest demons is his own self-doubt and his belief that he isn't enough. And I really hope that part of his journey next year will be the realisation that he is already enough just as he is because he asks Penelope, he's so awestruck by what Penelope's just said about what she wants for her life. And he says, what could possibly measure up to all that? And I just want to grab him by his cravat yes. and be like, you, Colin, the answer is you, <laughs> you are enough. And I don't know if he's going to struggle with to accept that in season three because he's heard what she wants from her life. He's let her down and he's going to try and help her get the life she wants. But I don't think he realises that he is maybe not the whole of that, but a hugely important part of that. Colin goes on to tell Penn that Lady Crane was right about her, implying that Marina said that Penn cared for him and would never forsake him. <laughs> but what she actually says in 204 is that there are people in his life that he makes happy and who care for him. But where on earth does he get the never forsake line? Marina says no such thing. Colin's subconscious is really doing some mental gymnastics here. He just plucks this out of thin air. And he mentions Marina a few times this season, as I'm sure you're all aware. But I really liked the shift here because it's not about Marina. It's about his relationship with Penelope. And he refers to Marina as Lady Crane here as well, which Veg touched on in a previous episode. So there's no more Marina or Miss Thompson. We see the sign that he's finally moving forward forward. Mm -hmm. But don't worry kids because Colin finally acknowledges that Penn cares for him. I love the little panic that she has when he says it because she's like, yeah. oh my god did Marina <laughs> just tell you yes. that I've been in love with you for my entire life? <laughs> but you know, Marina kind of but not at all actually told him and you know what? He is beginning to believe that now. Beginning. <laughs> we are 14 episodes in and he's beginning to believe that Penn <laughs> might just care for him a little bit. <laughs> Talk about a fucking slow burn. You know what? Sometimes that happens. Not everything can burn with quick, sudden passion. I know, babe, but, you know, there's slow burn and then there's just not even turning the fucking gas on the hob, isn't there? Like, <laughs> we just need... I'm not saying that about their relationship. I just mean in general, just this journey that we've been on together. <laughs> and after that, they're just left gazing into one another's eyes. <laughs> Colin looks so certain in his revelation about Penn and she is looking quietly awestruck. It's just beautiful. Yeah. Yeah. The only thing that could break Colin's gaze. Okay, yeah. and I also now cannot watch the scene without hearing the extra who woos in the background here after the <laughs> crowd exclaims as <laughs> the cake is being cut. I miss that. I miss that. Colin says, it appears we had better nab a piece of cake before it's all gone. And in the background, in the middle of his sentence, you hear someone going, woo! Yes, we better nab a piece of cake. A piece of cake. <laughs> so much just really into cake. This is the level of detail that our What About Apollon podcast listeners tune in for. <laughs> but of course, Colin sprints off the cake. Cake and pen, the dream come true. I also sprint for cake. <laughs> also, I think we've talked about this before, but he says we had better nab a piece of cake before it's all gone. Does he get a slice of cake for Penelope? And does he go back to find her and just she's just fucked off to find L? She's ran off after L. My man's drunk, and you know exactly what he's doing. He's like. <laughs> Like, we'll get some cake. He wants her to walk with them and get cake and then they go and talk to each other. But what probably ended up happening is they got cake, she went away and he was like, fuck yeah, I'm drunk. I want this cake. And he no. just ate it all in front of... Yeah. yeah. He ate both slices? Yeah. yeah probably. We're building to my rant now. That this genuinely concerns me and upsets me. She does go back to him, right? I don't know. I mean, you cannot have Colin is skipping off being like, me and Penn are going to eat some cake together. It's going to be great. I'm going to get to look at her really pretty necklace <laughs> that's just so beautiful and eat my cake at the same time. And for Penn, cake means love, sexuality. She's like, I got to get in there. So yeah, maybe she hurried back to him. I can't <laughs> abide the fact that she doesn't go back to him and that he's just left there being like, she didn't want to 
have cake with me? She wants to have cake with you, boy. Let me tell you something. When I had a crush on Tuba Boy, Tuba Boy, boy. even now currently, I will like be like, am I being too much? Sure, we're going to go and get this cake thing or whatever. But you sit there and you think, oh, like, should I talk to him more? Or should I not be annoying and like go away? Because you like have this fear that you're gonna annoy them and you like them so much. And then all of a sudden they won't like you back. Oh yeah, I get that. Yeah, I am a socially awkward person. So if someone said to me like, oh, let's go nab a piece of cake, but then walked off without me, I might have been like, oh, should I, should I stay? Should I go? Yeah, Mm -hmm. I would be in my head. On a humorous note, Penn might be like so wrapped up in the conversation they had because the camera lingers on her in that moment. And there was just this really beautiful shot of her waves flying in the wind. Mm -hmm. And she's just watching him walk away. And she might not even have heard the line about the cake, to be honest. (laughs) Yeah. And I guess it's also one of those things, too, is you always got to leave them wanting more. So maybe that's just what she was. I mean, that's probably not. She was probably freaking out in her head. (laughs) And as I said, the camera lingers on Penn. There's just this really beautiful shot and the music is really beautiful too. When we were preparing for our music and playlist episodes and before then as well, I cannot tell you how much we all hunted for the music that plays at the end of this mm-hmm. scene. I was pulling up every AI recognized That's the song right. app. We were listening through classical music catalogs, went through the soundtrack 300 times and it's not fucking there. Also, there's specific forums online which are like, name this song. And other people have asked, what is this bit of music as well? This has come up quite a few times on the sub. It's a mystery. Yeah, it's a mystery. Yeah. There's no answers. And because of this fact, we think that this could be the pollen theme. So we've yeah. thought Kate and Anthony have a musical theme. So did Daphne and Simon. Mm-hmm. So we are very hopeful and very excited that we've heard a little preview of their Theme. Yeah, we think this might be an early tease of the mm-hmm. the pollen theme. And there we yes. go. That wraps up my most beautiful scene, and it is perfect and gorgeous and glorious. And I'm uh, singing with uh, the angels, uh, uh, and uh, it's just, what do you want, Veg? What do you want? <laughs> Go on, go on. I've said nice things about it, but this scene is always referred to as the purpose scene, okay? Yes. So this is what I've completely conditioned myself to forget how this scene actually goes and how that is a problem for the future, okay? And I'm very cross about it and you guys can frown lecky as much as you like. <laughs> if I... you could see our faces right now, we're not but impressed with I... <laughs> Edge. Right, so in this scene, we refer to it the purpose scene, but it's not the purpose scene. Yeah. It's, if you ever applied for a job and they tell you you're the preferred candidate, because that is exactly what he's fucking saying to Penn. He's saying you're the preferred candidate. <laughs> oh, I don't right? think so. He's so... saying to her, like, why the fuck would you say to someone, oh, I'm beginning to believe that now about someone caring for you. It's like he's saying to her, you've done a great job, babe. You're about to get the job of my courting person wife. No. You're the preferred candidate. And then he fucking rips it all away in 208. And I'm so fucking cross. And we know if he just said the thing in no. 208, then mm. fine. But we know that it's not like he's going to come back and propose. Like, they've still got to get to that point in yeah. season three. It's not like he would have been ready. Why the frick would he say that stuff? This is like what does he think cares for means i'm so annoyed right the prosecution may rest their case the defense may speak (laughs) the witness has run away (laughs) in defense of colin if we go back to episode 202 where colin says that he's swearing off women he's not ready to re-enter the world of courtship Mm -hmm. in this scene he's saying he's seen pen in a new light Mm -hmm. and he finally is aware that she cares about him possibly as much as he cares about her obviously he doesn't know about the depth of her feelings but he's not saying i see you as a romantic prospect he's saying that i see you in a new light i see that you care about me that we're really great friends and and courtship is not on his mind jesus christ boys okay now i'm gonna i'm gonna intervene here because i do see what you mean veg because i think and i think it matters we've talked before about how pen thinks she's having a very different season to what she actually ends up having and she learns that very severely the scene is the main fucking reason miscommunication now now what i'll say is i don't think colin is doing this at all intentionally i think they're both on very different speeds of path and very different you know she's on the highway he's taking the scenic view through the mountains and i don't think he's doing this with any sort of intentionality i don't think he really thinks because what i always think about colin when he speaks to pen and the reason that she gets so hurt sometimes by her the conversations is when they're speaking i think his guard comes down with her especially when you know a fucking hip flask has been involved the whole day (laughs) i think 
it, he can just say things and offer part of himself where he speaks without reservation. And I think sometimes he doesn't think about how it comes across to her. And she yeah. does get led on this season. She does. We've said it before that, it, you know, he takes loads of liberties with her that he shouldn't. He's not doing it intentionally, but I understand how Penelope comes out of this scene. And then in the next episode we'll get to, that builds and builds and builds to it. And everything yeah. builds to a point where you do understand why she's at this level, which is good. That's yes. going to be typified by when she skips back to her bedroom in 208 after their dance and she's flying high and then she's yes. going to crash and burn. So I, I do know what you mean, Veg, that it's so frustrating that her hopes are up here and that they have a moment like this. Mm -hmm. She has all the evidence and every piece of evidence makes her more and more confused. Mm -hmm. It's only at the very end where she gets the definitive piece of evidence that case closed that's it. Mm -hmm. So I get what you mean. Mm -hmm. Lekki, are you all right? Have I, have I upset you there? Oh, I just completely disagree with you, but it's fine. But I, I mean, <laughs> oh my God. No big deal. We're going to no have deal. another break in the podcast. I will say, I will say I'm Switzerland on the subject. I'll be Voice honest. Beans. <laughs> I do understand why Penn takes this scene yeah. differently, but Colin doesn't mean to tell her that he returns her feelings. He's saying mm. that I believe in the deep connection that we have, the friendship that we have. He doesn't yeah. realize there's something more yet. And just every point from this point on it becomes something more than friendship for him but he he hasn't made that connection yet i just think it's a good old pollen miscommunication and it yes exactly and it burns everyone but mostly us let's move on <laughs> yeah final scene lucky before we break up the podcast again god we're very on shaky ground at the moment <laughs> Sadly, because we are cursed, we can't have any beautiful pollen scene without something working to interrupt them. And here we get a hilariously annoyed Pen noticing that Eloise trying to sneak away, forcing Pen to go over and see what's up. Cock blocking once again, Elle. Yeah, Eloise has made a classically impulsive decision to visit Theo. It's completely reckless. How's Pen going to deal with it? So Pen tries to discourage her to no avail. And on a lighter note, I love that Pen's solution here is trying to convince Elle to go look at the peacocks. <laughs> <laughs> It's just so bizarre. It's like, baby, you're scraping the bottom of the barrel there, aren't you? Yeah. Well done, Penn. Excellent diversion tactic there. Shockingly, it doesn't work, actually. And Elle points out that she doesn't need Penn to say anything and that she's only telling her because they're friends and God forbid there are secrets between friends, right, Penn? Mm -hmm. All going to blow up in Penn's face. We can feel it coming as Eloise slips away. As the episode comes to a close, we hear Lady Whistledown say, Indeed, some may call a wedding the ultimate act of faith, while others would venture that it is the ultimate act of fools. I would say more about this, but we're still trying to pull our friendships together <laughs> after the schism that nearly formed during our recent Q&A episode, so I'll still this one for now. I mean, we're not doing too hot right now, actually. But... <laughs> but I will point out that in the final voiceover of this episode, we hear Penn instead discuss the concept of marriage, and if you read between the lines, it almost sounds like she's criticizing the queen here for becoming so involved in Antony and Edwina's wedding, with her implying that humans, and perhaps queens, not only complicate matters with their ceremonies and cakes, but they're also stubborn enough to believe that they must orchestrate what nature has already ordained. So, as the episode actually comes to close, sidestepping our war flashbacks about the wedding, <laughs> Quinsley hands Queen Charlotte one of the miniature portraits we saw at the beginning of the season, hinting that they've finally found Lady Whistledown, and I'm sure that won't create any drama next episode. Dun, 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 and there ends our beloved purpose episode. Lecky, ah. come on a whistle up. Shush, Veg. I can already hear you. I can see you muttering, Veg. <laughs> it's the purpose scene. This is maybe the real turning point in Pollen's relationship and Luke and mm -hmm. Nicholas acting is just perfection. But the scene um, where Lady Danbury and Violet become hysterical about the peacocks is a close runner up for me. What about whistle down? <laughs> Again, for me, I find it very uncomfortable when Penn tries to manipulate Eloise like she does on a few occasions mm -hmm. in this episode. Notably in the church where she tries to force Eloise into admitting she's seen yeah. Theo recently. It's just a, a bummer. Yeah. Not going to end up well. What are we thinking bow wise? This is maybe a one. Is this a one for you? This is a, probably a one for me. I'm going to give it a three for me. Six. A six? I'll grow up, Veg. <laughs> Gross. Oh my goodness. I just think we maybe need to start having conversation about what the podcast is, what it hopes to be, and how not everyone can be along for the whole journey in life. Right. Listeners, you face a choice. Are you going to stick with what a barb? Are you going to move on to Obs's observations? Or are you going to listen to the Colin Dwa Souffrir podcast? Or are you going to listen to Harry Potter, a uh, podcast about all of the animals in the Harry Potter universe? <laughs> and I'm uh, I'm just going to quit podcasting altogether and just go back to making edits. <laughs> it was a happier time for you, Lecky. We are joking in case that gets lost in the translation. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, some of us are joking. 
Anyway. Since you all asked my opinion, oh, I'm oh, going to no. give this. Oh, oh my so God. <laughs> Darn it. A two. I love it. I love it. I just think the stuff with Eloise is a bit of a bummer. And I'm still waiting. I'm still waiting for my number one, you know. I don't give out ones easy like you do left, right and centre. I wait for something truly special so it's two for me and that brings i mean it was a chunky chunky episode that brings a little it to a close. chunk i don't know why i did that <laughs> and it's only gonna get better next week as we join mm-hmm. pen and colin for a little chat on the staircase yes. maybe and then a immediate downturn <laughs> So please join us next week as we continue our poll and rewatch. But until then, Lucky, where can everyone find us? You can find us at WhatabarbPod on Instagram and TikTok. And you can find us on reddit.com forward slash r forward slash Paul and Bridgerton. And there's nothing left for it but for Beans to see us out. <laughs>